Well, it's uh, June 7th, 2018, and I'm Nancy Gross, and I'd like to welcome Andrea Graham here to the Library of Congress. And Andrea has just given a wonderful Botkin lecture on the art of the hunt and is a, a well-known and widely respected folklorist, especially uh, um, known for her work on the Intermountain West. So we're going to be talking a bit about your career, Andrea, and uh, how you got into folklore and what, <laughs> what you're doing and some of your projects, because you've been involved in many projects over the mm. years. So welcome. Okay. Let me start by, by at, where are you from originally? Um, born in Schenectady, New York, upstate mm -hmm. New York, and lived there for till I was in junior high, and mm -hmm. then my family moved to suburban Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So finished high school there, went to college at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, but my parents were always, we were always traveling, and we would always visit things like local historical societies and historic house museums, and we'd have to ride the steam trains because my dad loves old trains. So I sort of grew up you know, interested in local stuff and that every place had a story. And I think that influenced my, my later interests. And, and uh, did you, you did a folklore as an undergraduate? No, I was uh, anthropology as an undergraduate at mm -hmm. Penn. I started as a biology major and I quickly figured out that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. It was more human behavior, so I switched to anthropology. And then I took an introduction to folklore class from Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimlet when I was probably a sophomore or a junior. Mm -hmm. And that was it. That opened up all the possibilities. Like, this is what I want to do. It's everyday life, but it's the creative um, parts of everyday life. And, you, you know, she talked about nicknames and jokes. And we went on field trips to a a palm reader in Philadelphia. We just it was just a wonderful class and she's a fantastic teacher. And that's that's why I became a folklorist. <laughs> so I finished my undergrad as an anthropology major and mm -hmm. then immediately applied to the folklore program that was at Penn at the time. Which was the, was it the leading one in the country? In yeah. The, this was in the 70s? S yeah, I uh, undergrad graduated in 78. Mm -hmm. Just had my 40th reunion. Congratulations. I didn't, I didn't go. And then uh, two more years of grad school mm -hmm. at Penn. And I never wanted a PhD. I never wanted to be a college professor. I wanted to be a public folklorist. And I didn't even know that term didn't exist. I didn't even, it was just getting started in the mid-70s. Um, so I didn't it's, it's know so there was such a thing, but I knew that's what I wanted to do, maybe from all of this spending all these time visiting museums. My mother used to work in a museum Which, where did um, you in Schenectady, the uh -huh. Schenectady Museum. I spent many hours looking through their exhibits, so I sort of had that mm -hmm. interest that I want to learn about this stuff, but I want to bring mm -hmm. it back to a public. So I knew that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Well, you were really among the first <coughs> generation of public folklorists. Um, mm -hmm. The NEA was just setting up state folklorists programs in right. the late the, the 70s? Mid, or? mid 70s is when the, the mm -hmm. NDA program, the Library of Congress program were established. So, so what was your first job as a folklorist? <laughs> it was working at the Blue Ridge Institute in Ferrum, Virginia, uh -huh. far rural southwestern Virginia, south of Roanoke. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine in grad school had mentioned that she knew the guy who was the director who had gone to Cooperstown. And who was that? Uh, Roddy Moore. And so I just wrote him a letter. This was back when you mailed letters, <laughs> looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. And so I just wrote and said, this friend of mine mentioned, you know, your organization, and I'm looking for work. And he wrote back and said, we don't have anything right now, but we've applied for NEA funding to set up an internship, sort of a training position mm -hmm. for a year, and we'll, we'll let you know. Mm -hmm. So he did. Got, he got back to me in the fall and said, we got this funding and he was up visiting family in New Jersey, so we actually met up and did an interview, and that was my first job. And so it was a small regional folk life program based at a college, a little Methodist college. Um, they did a folk life festival, they did exhibits, I helped them set up an archive, I learned to write for program books and write press releases and exhibit text and everything that I do today I learned on that job because my education at Penn was very theoretical. There were no classes in public folklore. Mm -hmm. So that first job was, that was my training ground. It was and, a wonderful and, experience. And how long were you there? I was there for almost two years. 
they had a farm museum. They had moved in farm buildings, so I got to dress up and cook over a fire. <laughs> it was a very small, and everybody yeah, got every, to do everything. Uh -huh. And they just threw me in and said, do this. Do you remember your first interview there? First field work? I did work? a project. Um, they let me pick a little field project, and so uh -huh. I entered... Um, I researched funeral traditions. I'm not sure why I was interested in that. I had done some gravestone research mm -hmm. earlier in grad school. So I interviewed, I don't even remember who I interviewed now, but I found mm -hmm. some interesting old photographs and mm -hmm. poked around in cemeteries. <laughs> and, then, and then from Ferrum, where did you go next? Next was the 1982 World's Fair in Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, you were involved in that. I involved in the World's I've heard Fair. stories. Tell, yeah. tell me about that. <laughs> well, it was there was this whole folk life festival component of the World's Fair, which went for six months, and it was seven days a week, you know, ten hours a day of performers and craft demonstrators, and I was running the food demonstration area. Um, we had a working moonshine still. A um, bunch of folklorists worked there. Yeah, who else was of, down there at the time? Um, Blanton Owen was the head... Well, uh, what was his name? Dick Van Cleek was sort of the manager. Um, I'm not sure where he is now. And Blanton was sort of the, the senior folklorist, so he did a lot of field work and scheduling everybody. Mm -hmm. um, Drew Beiswinger worked there. I'm trying to remember who else. Was a lot Peter, of folklorists. Was Peter Bartis down there at the time? I don't think so. I think maybe Mick Maloney did some of the original research and planning mm -hmm. for the festival. Um, and lots of artists came through, and um, I was going to say something. Like that, that's really that's <laughs> really kind of learning under fire. So six yeah. months every six day. Six months every day, all day. Um, oh well, Mary Hufford is the one who uh, she started out working there, and she set up the foodways mm -hmm. um, program, and then she got the job at the Library of Congress, and she left mm -hmm. a month or two in, and so I was able to step in and uh, do the food waste demonstration. We had people cooking possums. <laughs> <laughs> the usual, yeah. Yeah, fried apple pies and grits and <laughs> southern food traditions. Mm -hmm. So it was, and then we had this working moonshine still that was with some very entertaining characters who were in charge of it and just telling all kinds of lies to the visitors. <laughs> <laughs> And so you were, that was in the early 80s? 84. 82. 82. Oh, 82. Mm -hmm. And then And we then go. we went to um, sort of without work for a while because the festival ended. Mm -hmm. and I well, was when you with, say we? I was with Blanton Owen at that point. Mm -hmm. Were you married at that point? Mm, not at that point. We were married later. Uh -huh. um, so we lived in um, uh Western North Carolina, near his brother, there was a house that needed a house sitter, so we had a place to stay, mm -hmm. and um, applied for jobs, and then he got a job in Florida, at the Florida program, to start their apprenticeship program. So we moved to White Springs, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, I did some contract work, and then one of the other staff people had left for a year to, to go back and get a degree, a master's degree, mm -hmm. so I filled in for her position. Who, who was, was that uh, Peggy Mary, Bolger? Oh. Uh, Peggy was there at the time. Okay. Yes, and Orma Peggy Loomis. Peggy Bolger was Peggy there, Bolger. who was here at the library for many years, right. of course. Yeah. yeah. Orma Loomis was the director of the program. Nancy Nuz was there when I was mm -hmm. there. Um, so it was a great group of folks, too. It, it was, it, it remains a small field, but at that, at that time, in the early 80s, there weren't that many people doing public sector folklore. And I remember it being, looking at everybody as sort of an extended family. Mm -hmm. Do you do you have that those memories? Oh too? yeah, that's you know I got to know people by working um, mm -hmm. in the, especially in the at, working in the South. There were a lot of folklorists there, mm -hmm. and so I got to lot know a lot of those folks. And Blanton had known a lot of them too, mm -hmm. as through music, and he'd been in the field longer than I had. So, mm -hmm. but it was slightly different than say being a historian, where if you came to someone's town. You sort of expected them to put you up and <laughs> stop everything and take you around? or Oh, yeah. At least I had a lot of house guests. You probably had a lot of house guests, uh -huh. too, at that time. Yeah. Maybe we were all just so underpaid that that was the way we got by. Uh, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, these were all short-term mm -hmm. contract jobs. Some of the first five years of my career was all, you know, grants or the World's Fair that had an end. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that was in the South, first five years I worked in the South. And, you know, parts of it I miss, the culture is so rich, and the music, and just the language and storytelling. So I always really enjoyed that. So when and how did you get to be shift your focus to the West? Um, Blanton had interviewed for the Nevada Arts Council folk artist, folklorist position. It was a brand new position. Mm -hmm. um, it was in 1980, no, 85. These were the state folk arts positions that um, Bess Lomax Hawes right. had held. They had applied at, at the NEA, right? Applied for NEA yeah. funding to mm -hmm. start a position, and partly what helped get the position was the first National Cowboy Poetry Gathering, which happened in January 1985, and the, the Arts Council had just gone to the legislature saying we would like to have a folklorist position. This was um, in Elko? Mm -hmm. in the, well, the Arts Council was in Reno, uh -huh. the state governments in Carson City. Uh -huh. So they had gone to the legislature and said, we would like a folklorist position, and then mm -hmm. the Cowboy Poetry Gathering happened, which got tremendous national publicity and stories in Time Magazine. And so the Arts Council was able to go into the legislature and say, this is why we need a folklorist. They'll do this kind of stuff and bring attention to Nevada and feature Nevada artists. So that really, that first gathering really sparked the position. Mm -hmm. So um, so Blanton got the position in the fall of 85 as mm -hmm. the folklorist for the Nevada Arts Council. So we moved to Nevada. That was culture shock. <laughs> <laughs> Although me moving from suburban Philadelphia to Ferrum, Virginia was pretty big culture shock too. Though I loved it. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs, but I've always since then gravitated to small towns and small communities, and mm -hmm. I just like that better. So we lived in this little town, Virginia City in Nevada, even though the office was in Reno. Um, so he started that program. I had done, I did some contract work. Um, we did a lot of work together. I ended up writing for the local weekly newspaper, just piecing together work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had no training as a journalist, but I knew how to interview people. <laughs> so so that was really fun. Mm -hmm. um, and we got connected with the Western Folklife Center, the Cowboy Poetry Gathering. We would go out to that every year and help with that mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. And who um, was running that at the time? <clears throat> Hal, Hal Cannon, Hal Ken. who had started it. So he was still the artistic director. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so worked in Nevada, and then Lent and I split up in about five years, 1990. Mm -hmm. And he took a leave from the job at the Arts Council, and they hired me as a replacement because they knew me, and I knew the whole <laughs> history of the program. And then he ended uh -huh. up just resigning from that position, so I took over that position. So 1990 to 2000, 10 years, I was... Mm -hmm. Um, worked for the state arts council, and it moved in the, it moved from Reno to Carson City in that time, to the capital where it should have been, mm -hmm. <laughs> where it belonged. It's much, it was much easier to have a presence with the other state agencies and the legislature when we were in the capital. And, and what kind of field work were you doing in, in Nevada? Um, I did a lot of work in Las Vegas, which was at that point, the early 90s, was just starting to really explode population-wise. Mm -hmm. People were coming in from all over the world, all over the country, for jobs, service jobs. Mm -hmm. But there's a tremendous number of immigrants from South America, the Philippines, um, there was an Ethiopian community. Um, so those communities were really starting to to grow, and so we did a lot of field work with those newcomer groups, mm -hmm. and it was it was hard because a lot of them hadn't found each other yet, and it's a very it's a twenty four hour town. People are working different shifts. It was very hard for people to get together, and so it was hard to do field work because <laughs> it was people hadn't made those connections. Wait, were you doing we work with the casinos at all? Um, a little bit. We did a little bit of work with the the traditions of the casinos, mm -hmm. like crap stealers, have an incredible language that they talk to each other so they can communicate without the players knowing what they're saying. <laughs> different <laughs> kinds of roles and different kinds of bets. I mean, it's a very rich language. There was actually a craps dealer who was documenting, he was documenting the traditions, the occupational traditions of his, of that field. And now was, I know some of your field work from that period, I think, has just come into the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. So are some of this material in our collection now? It was, think? I think it was the stuff from 85 to 90 
is what's been sent so far. Mm -hmm. So that was mainly when Blanton was running the program, but I did a lot of that field work, helped with a lot of that field work. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, the Arts Council has been getting that stuff organized and it's all you know, slides and black and white film and cassette tapes. Oh, we're and delighted <laughs> to have it here and we've, we've heard very, the, um, the material I've seen has been excellent. And the archivists love that it's coming in in very good shape. Yeah, so, yeah. well, Rebecca Snetzlar, who works for the Arts Council, is one of their folk arts program managers, is really good at organizing mm -hmm. stuff. So I think she's working on a, you mm -hmm. know, the next batch of stuff. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of stuff in Las Vegas. So we started a folk life festival down there working with the city and the county cultural affairs and the state museum had a branch there and um, put together a festival to, you know, feature these artists who had come in that a lot of people who lived there didn't know about, you know, didn't know these newcomer artists. Mm. And it kept going for, I'm not sure it's still going, because we eventually had to pull back because it was just taking all of our time. And we had also started a similar festival in Reno working with the local arts council. So it started in Reno. So we were doing two festivals a year and we couldn't do anything else, you know, and the idea was that these local groups would pick it up mm -hmm. and the Reno group wasn't able to. Las Vegas, they kept it going for quite a while. And then we also had an apprenticeship program. So we were working with um, a lot of Native American artists through that program. Mm -hmm. um, basket makers, there was sort of a revival of basket making among the Washoe, uh, Paiute, and Western Shoshone were the three main tribes. Mm -hmm. and they organized a basket makers group that we helped support that was teaching and um, really strengthening that tradition. So that was wonderful. That's wonderful a nice feeling see. when when you feel you've helped yeah. sustain something. And yeah, I mean, it came from them. The impetus came from them. We were just able to support it, fund it. And, Mm -hmm. Promote it. So, you were you left in uh, the Nevada Arts Council in two thousand. Mm -hmm. And and where and where did you go from there? From there, I went to Pocatello, Idaho. Um, I had met another guy who lived there, mm -hmm. and so we got married and, mm -hmm. and moved there. And he he had a daughter who lived there, so he couldn't leave. So I was the one who had to move, and he understood, and he had a much better paying job than I did. <laughs> um, so he understood I was gonna be freelancing, and that mm -hmm. was okay with him. And I was able to um, do quite a bit of work. I just let people know that I was available for, for contract work, and um, especially you know people in state arts councils, they're so busy doing paperwork and managing grants that they never have time to go out and do field work. So that's what they needed help with, was people, they would have a, a particular region or a particular topic and they needed some field work. So I did a lot of contract field work. Like, like small jobs, small yeah. contract jobs. Like for example, what? what um, one of them, well one of them was back in Nevada, um, a county on the far, the Utah border, mm -hmm. um, just a, a one county and they just hadn't really done much work out there and just wanted a folk life survey of you know, who was there in the way of traditional artists. So did that, and then actually the county next to it, the adjoining county in Utah, um, they had been talking about creating a heritage area in that, that region. It was supposed to be, originally supposed to be bigger and other people backed out. So it was these two counties sort mm -hmm. of centered on Great Basin National Park, which is right on the border. Mm -hmm. um, so the people in Utah knew that I was working in Nevada, and they said, "Would you come do the same thing here on you know our side of the oh, our yeah, side of the uh -huh. line?" So we worked through the State Arts Council in Utah, mm -hmm. and got I think it was humanities state humanities funding. So then I did a field survey in in that adjoining county. So we had the two counties um, and made some recommendations on these are the things that you could promote yeah. through a heritage area, and it is now. Of the Great Basin Heritage Area. Could, could you just take a minute and describe when you do a survey, how do you go about doing a full, you, you're dropped in the middle of someplace you've never been before, where do you even start? <laughs> That's, usually you have a few leads, maybe, you know, somebody who ever set up the project maybe knows a few people and you just start with those people and Ask them if they know anybody else who does these kind of things. So I'll what kind of things would you be looking for in, in say, oh, in that area? You know, quilters, 
um, wood carvers, occupational traditions. I've always included that, even if it's working for an arts council, mm -hmm. you know, so cowboy poetry would be, I mean, that's ranching community, mm -hmm. um, different occupations. It has a history of mining, um, so not really active anymore, but people who used to work in the mining industry. Mm -hmm. um, local museums, I always go to the local museum because they know people and sometimes they'll have stuff in their collection. It's like, it's obviously a homemade something and you say, who made that? Um, I was working in Idaho in Twin Falls, Idaho and um, went in a museum and saw these little folded paper umbrellas and like Japanese lanterns made out of folded paper. I said, who made those? And I said, oh, this old Japanese guy who's lived here all his life. And I got his name and went and interviewed him about how they, he made these out of old um, placemats <laughs> that he got from the senior center because he needed a whole bunch with the same design and just these folded paper umbrellas. And so I found him at a museum. So local museums are great resources have you heard the people. term windscreen survey? Yeah. Yeah. Which Some of it's just driving around and looking at the landscape. You know, people make like customized mailboxes. Uh -huh. I love those. You know, <laughs> that look like tractors or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. So I'll take pictures of those. So that's the kind of windscreen stuff. Or yeah. ranch gates like I talked about in the talk. Um, you know, who makes those metal signs on ranch gates. Sometimes you can find out and then talk to that person. You know, shops, sometimes local shops will have local artisans work. Mm -hmm. I found a guy who makes willow furniture doing this Nevada survey. I think he had some little baskets or something in a shop and found out who he was. It's sort of like detective work. Yeah. It is. It is. And everyone you talk to, you ask, do you know anyone else who makes things or sing songs or whatever? Mm -hmm. You know, cowboy gear makers. Um, they're harder to, sometimes they're harder to find because they just make gear for their friends, you know, unless you happen to talk to somebody mm -hmm. who knows them. Local architecture, um, you know, if there's a distinct building style, especially on ranches. Hmm. Like barns or, or barns fencing? Or, or, mm -hmm. Fences, their traditional patterns of the way people will set up a ranch stead. Mm -hmm. <coughs> <Figured> that out. <coughs> <coughs> so, so. So you were in Pocatello till till when? I was there for nine years, mm -hmm. I think, and I had been doing some contract field work in Wyoming mm -hmm. for the Arts Council on this hunting project. I'd also had a long-term contract with the South Dakota Arts Council managing their state folk arts program. They only have three people on their staff. It's a very small agency, but they got NEA funding for a contract folklorist position to manage their program. So they have an apprenticeship program, and then I would do various projects, a lot of exhibits. So you're working both Wyoming and, uh, and South Dakota? And South, well, yeah, as part-time work. And I would, How much driving did you do? <laughs> my poor little car. I was putting 20,000 miles a year on my, for field on work, my little car for <coughs> yeah, field work. So um, in 2009, the... Um, University of Wyoming American Studies program had established this position basically for a public folklorist. It's it's classified as a researcher in their system. who probably really research public programs. Um, and Annie Hatch at the Wyoming Arts Council had worked with John Dorst and the American Studies program to, to set this position up. They got gotten NEA funding. Um, so that job opened up mm -hmm. in 2009. So moved to Wyoming, and that was only three-quarter time when it started, but I still had the South Dakota contract that had been mm -hmm. going every year, so I knew the two of those jobs together, I could support myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved to Laramie 
It's a small town in Wyoming where the university is based, and it's the only university in the state, the only four-year university. Hmm. Um, and the American Studies program had been very supportive, and Annie Hatch was there to work with, also with the mm -hmm. Arts Council. So we did this big Art of the Hunt project that was already underway, and I'd actually done some contract field work. The one that you just gave a Botkin lecture on today, right? right? Yeah. So I had done some field work already, and then when I came in, I knew that was going to be my big project. So, mm -hmm. And it was something that I knew very little about. I don't have hunting background, so it was a real education. But it relates to everything in Wyoming. I mean, hunting is just a part embedded in the culture. So it was a great way to get to know the state. And what are you working on now? Um, after we finished the, the Art of Hunt project. Which was 2014? Which been, well, the exhibit was 2014. It was up through Labor Day 2015. Okay, so. So then it was over, and like this had been six years of my life, and Andy and I both kind of set up and said, now what? You know, we'd, we had just been so focused on that project. And I have a lot of flexibility at the university. Um, so uh, I need to come up with another project. And I had noticed driving around doing a lot of this survey work, these little community buildings, community halls, in either very small towns or sometimes out in the country, out not near anything else. Some of them were obviously still used. Some of them looked like they weren't. But I just got curious about these community halls. And I had seen them a little bit in Nevada. I'd seen them in western South Dakota in rural communities. And so I just got curious. Who built these halls? When were they built? By, you know, why? What were they used for? How why did they, they function in the, the community? Right. Um, are, why are some of them still used and some of them looks like aren't? Um, so that, I just picked that as my project and started driving around and finding these buildings and trying to find someone who would let me in, you know, figuring out who the, the people in charge were. A, a lot of them are founded by women's clubs. Really? Um, homemakers clubs or through extension or just a group of women in a rural community who got together to meet and, you know, visit and have luncheons and whatever, and then they would decide like our houses are too small for this we need a place where the community can get together and meet mm -hmm. and so they would raise money and have bake sales and box socials and get their husbands to build a building <laughs> and um, so a lot of them that's how they happen but they must have I mean there's sort of a pattern to them so they must have were they communicating? Did they hear about others or see other ones? Or was it just sort of a logical, mm -hmm. sort of logical, like we need a place together to get together. Let's build a building. Um, in some communities, it was the school that was already there, like a one-room school sort of mm -hmm. served as a community center. Mm -hmm. A lot of those schools have closed when they were consolidated, and so they would turn them into an official community center. A lot of them are former schools. Mm. Um, and some of them... The community, for whatever reason, kind of dried up and people aren't there, and so the halls were abandoned. Um, some of them are very, very actively used, especially the ones that are in really in small towns, so there are people around. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of them where, you know, the firemen meet there and they have church services there and 4-H meets there. and so a lot of them really had, the nexus of their communities. Yeah. A lot of them, especially in earlier days, were dances. Every Saturday they'd have a dance in these halls that's brought people together. Um, funerals, wedding showers, anniversary parties. So they're just wonderful community spaces. And, you know, how does a community keep develop its sense of community? And these places really help with that. So I'm in the midst of doing field work. I have a list of about 80 so far around the state, mm -hmm. and I know there are more. <laughs> so it's just getting out on the road and finding them or finding out who has information hmm. about them. And that's the okay. same thing. Every, I go to one and I say, do you know of any others here? And they'll tell me and I'll say, who should I talk to about that? And they'll get me a phone number. So just basic field work. Field work, technique. detective work, yeah. If you could step, step back, the whole idea of doing, what attracts you to the Intermountain West? 
Is the, it the landscape or the people or the way it's played out? Or do you see it as, as, a, as a unique region? As a region, yeah. Yeah. It's different than the Midwest or the coast. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I've just gotten very fond of it. You know, I never dreamed I'd end up, <laughs> end up out west. But, you know, these small, like I said, I like smaller communities. It's much easier to do field work because everybody knows everybody. You're never more than two degrees of separation from anybody in Wyoming. You talk to someone and you find out you have someone in common that you know. It happens all the time, and I, that's what I love about, <laughs> about Wyoming. Some of these are like Las Vegas, especially when I was there and people hadn't, these communities hadn't coalesced. It was very hard to do field work because people didn't know each other, and that's mm -hmm. how you do field work is making that chain of connections. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to do in small towns and rural areas. So that's one thing that I like. Everybody knows, you know, these ranchers live 100 miles apart and they know what's going on in each other's lives more than I know my next door neighbors. Oh, and why do you yeah. think that is? They depend on each other. You hmm. know, people have this idea of sort of rugged individuals and, you know, we don't need anybody, but they totally need each other and depend on each other. And if someone's branding, all the neighbors for 100 miles will come and help and then they'll go help the other neighbor in hmm. return. Um, so they do um, depend on each other because they are so isolated. And I think it's the same of folklorists in the region too. <laughs> when we moved out, um, the the Western Regional folklorists had been meeting in Logan, Utah, for several years in conjunction with this Fife Conference that Utah State's folklore program put on. Mm -hmm. So they would bring in some folklorists as presenters, and the Western public folklorists. I'm trying. We, we tried to figure out what the first year was, but it was in the early 1980s. So it was the first regional group of folklorists to get together. And I think it was the same thing. We were so scattered. I wasn't there at the time, but they were so few and so scattered, they needed to get together. It was like their community hall. <laughs> they had to get together and uh -huh. support each other and share stories about how they were building their programs. They were all new programs in their states. So we connected with that group when we got out west, and that was wonderful and met you know, lifelong friends, and we wouldn't see each other once a year. Same with the ranchers, but we knew what, yeah. what we were up to. You kept in close. Sense of, yeah. sense of community. And then when the Cowboy Poetry Gathering started, which started from that meeting, they wanted a regional project that they could do together, and somebody came, you know, they had started hearing about these cowboy poets, realized they were all over. And so that was a regional project that brought everyone together and ended up as the, the gathering and this now the Western Folklife Center in Elko, Nevada. So we get together there too. Mm -hmm. All the folklorists come in and help host sessions. So the... Um uh, the community halls. You are, are you teaching also, or um, <coughs> you were involved with a uh, tr uh, field school with uh, the American Folklife Center last summer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, my job at the university eventually, so a year, two years ago, became full time. It mm -hmm. had been three quarter time, and the university found some extra funding. Um, yeah. Uh, do I remember rightly that that's when you stopped working at South Dakota? That's when I stopped. They overlapped. There was about nine months where I was still doing both, and yeah. it was too, just too much. <laughs> I couldn't. Uh -huh. I couldn't be in two places uh -huh. at once. So, a year ago, June, I dropped the South Dakota job after 15 years, which was sad. I really liked it, but it, I just couldn't keep doing it. So the university job is full time, and what was added was teaching one course. Uh -huh. So I teach a course on public sector work in American Studies, um, which is mainly guest speakers, people coming in you know, from mu museums, archives, Humanities Council, Main Street programs, all kinds of, you know, public sector cultural work so the students can hear from people who are actually doing that work. Mm -hmm. And so I've taught it once. I'm teaching it again in the fall, but I'm supposed to teach that every year. So that's been a new, <laughs> a new challenge for me 
Um, and, the, and then you were, did, I, I forget, did the American Folklife Center approach you, or you, you and the Western Folklorists approached the American Folklife Center? For the, the field whole, school? For the field school in 2017. Um, I went out, the University of Wyoming has a research station in Grand Teton National Park, mm -hmm. right on the shores of Jackson Lake. It's an old, it started as a ranch, and then it was sort of vacation homes, or these, all these historic log buildings. And all summer they have researchers who come in, mostly biology and geology and scientific researchers who uh -huh. can stay there and do research projects in the park. So I went up there, a colleague of mine at the university was doing historic preservation programs and she had a field school out in Teton Park one of the first years I was there and I went out for a couple of days and we mm -hmm. did some oral history interviews. So that's when I saw this research station, the AMK Ranch. I immediately said this would be a perfect place do a folk life field school because <laughs> it's so beautiful and it's inexpensive to stay there if you're connected with the university. So mm -hmm. I've been thinking about it for years, um, but just me by myself couldn't really organize something like that that far from home. And I saw that the Utah State Folklore Program had done a field school a couple summers ago in Logan working with the Folk Life Center staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I approached them. I said, are you guys going to do this again? Would you like to do a joint one? I have this great place that we could, <laughs> that we could do a field school. So they said, well, okay. So, um, I mean, it took us, you know, a year and a half of planning because the logistics of working that far away from either of our bases. But we talked to the cultural branch at Teton Park about a project. Did they have any research they wanted done? And they suggested dude ranching. Because there's one dude ranch that's actually in the park, mm. um, the last one that's still operating in the park. And they said, we would like to, you know, what is contemporary dude ranching traditions? And you could help us document that. And we said, that sounds great. So we worked with the uh, Folk Life Center staff using your model. Yeah, mostly uh, um, Maggie Cruzy on our staff Maggie and Guha and Shankar. Guha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they had sort of the model, the school, field school model. Mm -hmm. And so we recruited students, most of them for Utah, from Utah State because they have a folklore program. But I had, we had three students from the University of Wyoming, worked with this research center to get the space reserved. We had a big log house that we were all staying in together. So we got there, and after a couple of days, we realized the house was full of bats. And there have always been bats at the research station. And the science guys just say, whatever, we're going to deal with it. We're not worried about it. But there were a lot of bats. And one of the other Utah State faculty who was there just visiting, she wasn't part of our school faculty, got really concerned about the bats and started asking around. And, because um, they, they might be rabid? They might be rabid. Yeah. Yes. I should preface by saying that the American Folklife Center has been doing um, uh, uh, training sessions and field schools for many, many years. But yours in 2017 became legendary <laughs> because... What and happened? Because the um, Jeannie Thomas from Utah State talked to the... An esteemed colleague. Talked to yes. the, I think the Centers for Disease Control. I mean, she yeah. went right to the top and yeah. said, there are these bats, you know, and they said, if you are sleeping in a room with bats, you don't know if you've been bit. You could have been bitten because they have little tiny teeth. And mm -hmm. um, they said, we recommend you don't stay there. And they were, it was a very recent population explosion in this house. It was sort of unexpected. Mm -hmm. I mean, they always had a few, but like there were baby bats everywhere and bats on the floor and bat guano all over the place and they were flying around and, you know, it was unnerving. Mm -hmm. And uh, so actually Utah State risk management said you can't stay there, you have to leave, mm -hmm. that their students had to leave. So we had to leave and they put us in another building at the research station for one night, but then they didn't have space. People were coming in, so we had to find somewhere else to stay in Jackson in August, in peak tourist season. Mm -hmm. So we eventually found motels at great expense, which Utah State and the university had to pay for. Um, and they had to shut down this the lodge. They wouldn't let anybody else stay there. And did and you also have to get party. rabies shots? And yes, most of us had to get rabies shots. Yeah, we preventive kept... measure, because you don't know. Yeah, we kept he, he, here in Washington. We kept getting these concerning emails and and phone calls about. We made the paper. Things. We made the local paper. They didn't quite get everything right, but you know, local group of students has 
run into hordes of rabid bats. Well, no, but <laughs> they could have been. <laughs> so we had to... It's nothing to fool around with. I mean, it's no. very serious. Yeah. So, and it's a whole series of shots. So it was very disruptive to the field school, but we kept going. Mm -hmm. we, we briefly thought of, like, do we need to bail on this? And we said, no, we want to keep doing it. And the students were amazing. They just charged into the field work. We sort of had to condense our training. Um, and then they had a week to do interviews with the dude ranch, the family that had owned the ranch for 70 years. Mm -hmm. um, many people in that family, but employees, guests. Um, we did lots of interviews about the traditions of dude ranching. And of course, it's a fascinating topic. It's right at the base of the Tetons. It's a spectacular location. Um, the students were great. I mean, they hung in there, and you know, most of them had to get shots. <laughs> most of us had to get shots. Um, it ate up some of our time. We were supposed to do a final presentation. The research mm -hmm. station has a series of presentations by mm -hmm. researchers, and so we were scheduled to, to talk about our field work, and we ran out of time. Plus, we were not allowed to go back there because of the bats. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to cancel that. We went back later. We went back in November, some of us. Well, some of us were supposed to go, and it mm -hmm. snowed, and we couldn't get there. But the Utah State people went back to Jackson and did a presentation on our um, mm -hmm. field research. And then they have put all of that material online. The Utah State Archive, Randy Williams, is just amazing. Um, so the whole collection is online. They did a little online exhibit about dude ranching traditions. So mm -hmm. it's, I mean, in retrospect, and we told all the students, we said this whole bat thing is going to make a great story. Maybe not right now, <laughs> but <laughs> you're going to be and telling be. this I mean, story people, to your people grandkids. People are so amazed. Yeah. By, and something yeah. you didn't prepare in your graduate school training for. But. Right. Yeah. So you just deal with it when it comes up, you know, when it's always something, it's usually not that dramatic. You know, in Utah State, they had been really strict about you know, they did training on, we all got bear spray, they talked about rats and hantavirus and all these things to be aware of, and nobody mentioned bats in that <laughs> safety training, and that was what did us in. But um, um, it turned into, I mean, I think we got really good results, and mm -hmm. we had a wonderful time. And the host, the family that owns this uh, Triangle X Dude Ranch, the Turners, are just the most hospitable, welcoming people. They were very generous. Let us troop around and ask questions. <laughs> and that's online? You can, you yes. Can, yes. Yeah. Through, if you go to the Fife Folklore Archive at Utah State, you can, you can find it. Okay. Yeah. Now, what haven't I asked you about? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was telling you earlier um, why I think I'm interested in folklore or why I'm a folklorist. Yeah, I grew yeah. up, um, you know, I grew up in these two different places in the East, but neither of them were where my family was from. So people ask me, especially out West, they say, where are you from? You know, and I usually just say back East because <laughs> that's, that's all I care about, you know, if you're not from Wyoming. I mean, they're very welcoming, but you know, usually that's enough. But I don't feel like I'm from anywhere. You know, because I don't have family roots in those places. I was didn't wasn't in any of either of them long enough to really feel like that's where I was from. And then I worked and moved around and worked in other places. And um, and I, like I said, I've always liked smaller towns and small communities. And I sort of always wish, you know, that maybe I was from a a traditional community that where you knew everybody. You know, which is what folk communities are. And I think that's my attraction hmm. to folklore is that I'm sort of envious of that way of life. And I'm sure it's not ideal ever, either, you know, where your neighbors know everything about you. But I like that idea of <laughs> knowing my neighbors. So I think that's a factor that I just sort of had this suburban upbringing and didn't have that sense of, of roots. And, and do you think folklore, working in folklore has given you these roots? <sighs> well, certainly the community of folklorists. I mean, they're my, they're my people. You know, even though they're spread out, and this Western, the Western group is very close. You know, we're all really good friends. You seem so to be doing a lot of going to each other's weddings <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. hanging out with each other, going on and vacation, and making plans for retirement, buying a big house together, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're my favorite people. <laughs> but I love working in these small communities too, and it's. 
partly it's because I think it's easier to work there because it's easy to make the connections, but I just like that sense of, of community. Well, well, thank you so much for coming to Washington to present oh, a lecture good. and also to just talk about things. We're delighted to have your field work from Nevada here and people will be using that. So yeah, th thank you, exciting. Andrea. Thanks for having me.